let's get some terminology out of the way. All of the recommender systems we've looked at so far are what's called top N recommender systems. That means that their job is to produce a finite list of the best things to present to a given person. Here's a shot of my music recommendations on Amazon, and you'll see it's made of 20 pages of five results per page. So this is a top N recommender where N is 100. As you'll soon see, a lot of recommender system research tends to focus on the problem of predicting a user's ratings for everything they haven't rated already, good or bad. But that's very different from what recommender systems need to do in the real world. Usually, users don't care about your ability to predict how they'll rate some new item. That's why the ratings you see in this widget are the aggregate ratings from other users and not the ratings the system thinks you'll give them. Customers don't want to see your ability to predict their rating for an item, they just want to see things they're likely to love. Throughout this course, it's important to remember that ultimately our goal is to put the best content we can find in front of users in the form of a top end list like this one. Our success depends on our ability to find the best top recommendations for people, so it makes sense to focus on finding things people will love and not our ability to predict the items people will hate. It sounds obvious, but this point is missed by a lot of researchers. Those top five or 10 recommendations for each user are what really matters. Here's one way a top end recommender system might work, and there are many ways to do it. But generally, you start with some data store representing the individual interests of each user, for example, their ratings for movies that they've seen or implicit ratings, such as the stuff they've bought in the past. In practice, this is usually a big distributed NoSQL data store like Cassandra or MongoDB or Memcache or something, because it has to vend lots of data, but with very simple queries. Ideally, this interest data is normalized using techniques such as mean centering or z-scores to ensure that the data is comparable between users. But in the real world, your data is often too sparse to normalize it effectively. The first step is to generate recommendation candidates, items we think might be interesting to the user based on their past behavior. So the candidate generation phase might take all of the items a user indicated interest in before and consult another data store of items that are similar to those items based on aggregate behavior. Let's take an example. Let's say you're making recommendations for me. You might consult my database of individual interests and see that I've liked Star Trek stuff in the past. Based on everyone else's behavior, I know that people who like Star Trek also like Star Wars. So based on my interest in Star Trek, I might get some recommendation candidates that include Star Wars stuff. In the process of building up those recommendations, I might assign scores to each candidate based on how I rated the items they came from and how strong the similarities are between the item and the candidates that came from them. I might even filter out candidates at this stage if the score isn't high enough. Next, we move to candidate ranking. Many candidates will appear more than once and need to be combined together in some way, maybe boosting their score in the process since they keep coming up repeatedly. After that, it can just be a matter of sorting the resulting recommendation candidates by score to get our first cut at a top end list of recommendations. Although much more complicated approaches exist, such as learning to rank, where machine learning is employed to find the optimal ranking of candidates at this stage. This ranking stage might also have access to more information about the recommendation candidates that it can use, such as average review scores, that can be used to boost results for highly rated or popular items, for example. Some filtering will be required before presenting the final sorted list of recommendation candidates to the user. This filtering stage is where we might eliminate recommendations for items the user has already rated, since we don't want to recommend things the user has already seen. We might also apply a stop list here to remove items that are potentially offensive to the user, or remove items that are below some minimum quality score or minimum rating threshold. It's also where we apply the N in top N recommenders and cut things off if we have more results than we need. The output of the filtering stage is then handed off to your display layer, where a pretty widget of product recommendations is presented to the user. Generally speaking, the candidate generation, ranking, and filtering will live inside some distributed recommendation web service that your web front end talks to in the process of rendering a page for a specific user. This diagram is a simplified version of what we call item-based collaborative filtering, and it's the same algorithm Amazon published in 2003. You can see it's not really that complicated from an architecture standpoint. The hard part is building up that database of item similarities, really. That's where the magic happens. Again, this is just one way to do it. We're going to explore many, many others throughout the course. 
Another architecture that's popular with researchers and that we'll see in this course is to build up a database ahead of time of predicted ratings of every item by every user. The candidate generation phase is then just retrieving all of the rating predictions for a given user for every item, and ranking is just a matter of sorting them. This requires you to look at every single item in your catalog for every single user, however, which isn't very efficient at runtime. In the previous slide, we only started with items the user actually liked and work from there instead of looking at every item that exists. The reason we see this sort of architecture is because people like to measure themselves on how accurately they can predict ratings, good or bad. But as we'll see, that's not really the right thing to focus on in the real world. If you have a small catalog of items to recommend, however, this approach isn't entirely unreasonable.